the etiquettes of leading and following in the prayer, right? Etiquettes associated with the congregation, inshallah ta'ala. So the Imam says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Adab al Imama wal Qudra. And we intend to learn and teach, to remember and remind, to share mutual benefit as well as to gain from these lessons, knowledge, inshaAllah ta'ala, to call the guidance and lead the good, to encourage holding fast to Allah's book and the Son of His Messenger, to call the guidance and lead the good, seeking in that Allah's countenance. Allah's pleasure, nearness, and reward, glorious and exalted is He. We intend what the author, Abu Hamad, Hujjah to Islam, Al Ghazali intended, and Imam Al Ghazali, as well as our Shaykhs and the Pious, of what Allah knows of good intentions. And again, continuing this lesson in the beginning of guidance by Al Imam Al Ghazali. So he says, the Imam should make the prayer brief. Right? So he's mentioning an etiquette of Imama. And that is takhfif, right? That the prayer be brief. And we'll go into some details of that. Anas radiallahu anhu said, I did not be pray behind anyone whose prayer was more brief or more complete than the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is narrated by Tabarani in Al Jama Al Mu'jam, excuse me, Al Mu'jam Al Awsat. So he has various. Um, Compilations of hadith. This is his uh, middle length comp compilation of hadith. So Anas mentioned the prayer of the Prophet was brief though complete. This is talking about the pro prescribed prayer in congregation, right? So um, tafif, um, tafif or brevity in prayer is a sunnah for being the imam, and that is. Um, when you're leading a congregation, you should not elongate certain positions that you would elongate if you were praying alone or if you were praying with a small, specific congregation in a masjid that is not frequented by other than them and they're satisfied with that, right? So excluding of someone who is alone or someone who fits that description, brevity is the sunnah for the Imam, right? So for instance, if the Imam bows, it is complete for him to say Subhana Rabbi al azim three times. To do the additional supplications beyond that is not recommended for an Imam because he should be brief, right? Um, and so on, right? That the same applies to other positions. The recitations, excluding the recitations that are specifically transmitted from the Prophet they should also be brief and up to the, uh, to the stamina of the people with whom he's praying, right? Um, and we say excluding the specific sunnas the Prophet established, like Alif Lam Mim Sajda and Hal um, Atta Ala Dinsan in the first two rakas of Fajr on Jumu'ah, right? That's a sunnah the Prophet established. The Imam does that even if uh, that is difficult for the stamina of the congregation because it was an established sunnah. Excluding that, um, the Imam should pace his recitations with um, his congregation. And then again, in his bows and his prostrations, he should not elongate. When someone is alone or leading a limited congregation in a masjid that is not frequented by other than them and no one else will join them and there's no one in the congregation that um, has a right that is due upon him or her from someone else, like an employee or like a wife, um, and they're satisfied with elongation, that person can elongate or someone who's alone. And in that case, it's recommended to elongate. The Prophet ﷺ, in his night prayers, he might recite Baqarah in one rakah, and he might bow for that long, and he might prostrate for that long, right? So he would pray for very long periods of time when he was alone. However, when you're leading a congregation, the Imam Brief, right, and there are rights that people in the congregation may have upon them. They may be an employee, they may be a wife, um, they may have responsibilities, there may be someone who's old, there may be someone who's sick, there may be someone who's young, um, and so brevity is a sunnah um, for the Imam. So then he continues The Imam should not make the opening takbir if the Mu'addin has not yet finished the call to commence, right? 
nor before the lines are straightened. The Imam should raise his voice with, with should raise his voice his voice with every takbir, but the follower should only raise his voice so that he can or she can at least hear him or herself. Okay, so the Imam, um, even in a silent prayer, the takbir of movement between positions, right? They call it takbirat al-intiqal, right? The takbir of moving between positions, the imam raises the voice, right? Um, however, the follower does not. The follower speaks loudly enough that he or she can him, hear him or herself. In all of the recitations, that, must, that much pronunciation must be made, right? That the, the follower can hear him or herself. Um, there are times when the follower will raise their voice in the view of some schools at Amin, for instance. Um, that's a time the follower will raise their voice. And there, this is an area of juristic difference. Um, some schools, the imam may as, recite and the follower will stand silently and not recite anything behind the imam. Other schools, the follower will recite. Um, and when the follower recites, the follower recites such that it is audible to him or herself but not allowed. Um, very little of the prayer of the follower other than Amin will be allowed behind an Imam. Right? Um, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. The Imam should make the intention of leading the prayer in order to attain the merit of doing so. If he does not form this intention, then as long as the followers have made their intentions to follow, their prayer is correct and they will attain the merit of following. Right, so um, again, this is speaking in the school of the Imam, right? And Al Imam Al Ghazali, he was is relatively strict with respect to intention, right? As Shafi'i said, the Hadith in the Mal bin Biyat, actions are through intentions, enter seventy chapters of fiqh, right? And Imami is uh, no exception. The congregational prayer is no exception. So what is he saying here? He's saying that um, the followers must intend congregation in order to have the merit of congregation and also um, it relates to the validity of their prayers right because you can't follow someone and wait for them for long periods of time um, and connect your movements to theirs without intending to be a follower right in the case of the follower intention to follow or intention for congregation is required in the case of the imam um, generally it's recommended for him or her to attain the merit of leading Right, of being in congregation, but it doesn't relate to validity because if they don't intend, what are they doing? They're just praying alone, right? If the imam doesn't intend, the imam is just praying alone, right? They won't have the merit of congregation if they don't intend. Um, the follower, however, if they don't intend and then they follow, they'll invalidate their prayer if they wait for a lengthy period of time because they're waiting for someone um, that they haven't intended to follow. There's an exception in Jumu'ah prayer, right? In Jumu'ah prayer, the imam must intend Right, because Jumu'ah, at least one rakah of it, must be prayed in congregation. Right, that is an exception. But generally, the Imam, uh, their prayer will not be invalid if they do not uh, intend congregation. And again, this is an area of schol scholastic difference. Right, the Imam and the Shafi'i, his school is very detailed. Um, so, what one would, would intend, the Imam would intend, uh, for instance, this, uh, this prayer we just made, Usalli Fard al Asar, Imam Lillahi Ta'ala. I intend to pray the obligatory uh, prayer of Asar the late afternoon prayer as an imam, right? Um, the follower would intend, Usalli fard al-asr ma'muman lillahi ta'ala. I intend an obligatory prayer of asr as a follower for Allah Most High, for instance. Or both of them could just intend in congregation. Usalli fard al-asr jama'atan lillahi ta'ala. I intend the obligatory prayer of asr. I intend to perform the obligatory prayer of asr. Um, in congregation for Allah Most High, that suffices for both the Imam and the follower. And again, um, the followers should make sure that they're intending um, and, and, and in view of in the legal school of the Imam. La ilaha illallah. And what is congregation? Congregation is Rabtu Salatil Ma'mumi bi Salatil Imami. Congregation is connecting the prayer of the follower to the prayer of the Imam. And when the follower's prayer is connected to the imam's prayer, uh, that traces of that effect 
transmit to the prayer of the follower, right? So if someone is praying behind an imam, and the imam made two rakahs before you arrived, you're masbuk, you're a latecomer. And during those two rakahs, the imam did something that um, is a faithfulness prostration, right? Say um, they, uh, they recited to shahwat in the first rakah cause of forgetfulness prostration and they realized it. So they prayed two rakahs that the imam, the follower joins them. They prayed two more rakahs, they've completed their four rakahs. The imam, the follower has only done two. The imam does forgetfulness prostration, right? The follower stands up and prays two more. What does the follower do at um, the end of the follower's prayer? The follower does forgetfulness prostration. Why? Because the traces of the forgetfulness in the prayer of the imam transmit uh, and have an impact on the prayer of the follower, right? Because there's a connection, there's a bond between their prayers um, and so on, right? And there's immense benefits that happen when a follower connects his or her prayer to an imam. Uh, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, the prayer of a congregation is better than the prayer of someone alone by 25 degrees, right? Um, 25 degrees better. The anticipation is that it is accepted because um, my prayer may have some deficiency and your prayer makes up for that deficiency and this other uncle's prayer makes up for, for a deficiency in his and so on. So that Allah combines what's complete from each of them to put together a, a, a complete prayer, right? Uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not transmitted in the Sunnah that he ever prayed alone Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is not transmitted that he ever prayed a prescribed prayer alone, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And you have um, the athar of the companions that in the time of the Prophet sallallahu only a hypocrite would miss the congregation. And a man would be brought between two others, unable to stand by himself um, and not miss the congregation. Right? So congregation is, is, is a solemn obligation, a collective obligation of the community. Someone who cares about his or her hereafter should endeavor to make all of their prayers in congregation that are legislated in congregation, right? There might be times where you can't perform a congregation, but when you can, you should endeavor that all of them be prayed in congregation. Imam al-Ghazali mentions in Ihya, the, the early um, generations, if someone would miss a congregation, they would give them condolences for a week. They say, you missed out. They say, Musab, Someone is not afflicted, not bereft, who is, loses loved ones. The bereft person is the one who loses reward, meaning the reward of that congregation where they got the reward that was 25 uh, times less or 25 degrees less. They would give them this condolences. If they missed the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam, they would give them condolences for three days. As the Prophet Sallallahu said, لِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ صَفْوَةٍ وَصَفْوَةُ الصَّلَاةِ التَّكْبِرَةُ الْأُولَىٰ مَعَ الْإِمَانِ Right? Everything has a choicest part. The choicest part of the prayer is the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam. Some of the shayukh of our shayukh, they studied as, as young men in the Rabat of Tarim. What is a Rabat? It's a place where students studied in the Rabat of Tarim. Muhammad al-Haddar, the Shaykh of, of many of our shayukh, some living uh, still Habib Zain bin Sumayt, one of his older students, still living. Habib Omar bin Hafid, uh, still living. And others, uh, Habib Muhammad al-Haddar, he said, since I was a young man seeking knowledge in Tareem, uh, in the Rabat of Tareem, I don't remember missing the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam. The Prophet sallallahu said, if someone um, prays 40 days of prayers without, mention, without missing the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam, he would have two freedoms written for him or her. A freedom from hypocrisy and a freedom from the fire. Right? Um, there's a secret in the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam. And the early generations would strive to catch that. The choicest part of the prayer, the Prophet ﷺ called it, the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam. Once um, a congregation was prayed with the desert Arab who joined the congregation. And he came out and, you know, um, all of his belongings are on his camel, right? His food, whatever, his property, clothing, everything he owns is on his camel and it had run off. So he was crying or hollering about this loss of his. Um, and Allah's messenger came out and asked, what was this um, commotion? 
and they said this desert man had lost his camel, and he said, oh, I thought he missed the opening Allahu Akbar. And he said, oh, Messenger of Allah, is the opening Allahu Akbar better than my camel? He said, it's better than your camel and the whole world full of your camels. Right? Um, and someone who's dedicated, dedicated to worship, dedicated to saluk, um, they should be dedicated to congregation. Right? So for this reason, our shiuk, um, they said to us repeatedly, if you see a seeker of knowledge who's not concerned with the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam, then wash your hands of him or wash your hands of her. I mean, they would say dust your hands in the Arab world. That's what they would say. It's dusty there. Meaning that um, if we're not concerned with this most important of our works, the choicest part of the most important of our acts of worship, then what's the benefit of seeking knowledge? As Imam Ghazali says in many places in this book, if you're not concerned with reward in the hereafter, then the yeah, What's the point of learning other than that you seek guidance by which you draw nearer to Allah? Um, so the opening of Allahu Akbar is something we should endeavor to. Prayer and congregation is something we should endeavor to. Uh, so one of our American brothers asked our shaykh, well, you know, what if I am not unable to pray a, a prayer in congregation? He said, then first call to heart the angels and arwah that might attend a congregation. The angels and spirits that might attend a congregation, and that occurs, right? Prophet Sallallahu said, if you're in a wasteland, in a wilderness, and you call an adhan and a kama and pray by yourself, angels like mountains pray with you, right? So angels will join a congregation at times uh, with, of an individual. So first call to heart that some may join you in the congregation that you pray. Um, maybe some of the believing jinn, maybe some of the arwah that are mutlaqa, that are uh, liberated and able to move in the creation will join your congregation. Call that to heart, and then repeat the prayer in time, ideally in congregation, or uh, as a makeup in congregation if you can. This is someone who's a person with a tariqah, yeah? they had a spiritual path and spiritual rigor they're engaged in, uh, engaged in, their shaykh prescribed this for them. Meaning, always pray in congregation. Always pray in congregation, if you don't, make it up. During the years that we had uh, spent seeking knowledge, we knew students in shiuch, if they missed opening Allahu Akbar, where they would make the prayer over. Right? Why? Wanting to send the best offering they could to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, so that not only was each prayer prayed in congregation, each prayer was prayed catching the opening Allahu Akbar. So that if they missed the opening Allahu Akbar, they would repeat. I'm not talking about people in the 5th century, or the 3rd century, or the 4th, 2nd century. I'm talking about people right now, people I know, people I met, uh, the generation immediately before, decades of his life without missing the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam. Um, and so congregation is something we should seek, right? At minimum, make a goal not to miss congregation, right? Not to miss congregation when you can. You got a house full of people, play, you grab each other and pray together. The men go to the to the masjid. Uh, ladies in the home uh, pray together if they're praying on the school they can. If some who are unable to go to the masjid remain behind uh, of the men, they should pray in the congregation in the home as well. Yes, sir. Question. So the the follower is saying that the prayer at the same time as Imam. So I guess when does the time of the opening the prayer end? Like, That's a what great question. Been? That is an excellent question. It may come, but um. So there is a question about the, the opening takbir, and the opening takbir of the follower must occur after all of the letters of the takbir of the imam are complete, meaning the hamza of Allah, the alif with the fetz on it, which is actually a hamza, the, the followers ah of Allah must follow the ra of the imam of akbar. So the imam says, Allahu Akbar. There's his ra. After that, the follower says, Allahu Akbar. If there's an overlap where some of the hamza of the follower overlaps with the, uh, before the ra of the imam, it's not valid. Right? So it should be immediately after the imam's whole takbir. And one catches the opening Allahu Akbar by engaging in takbir uh, and no other things other than the, the, the things connected to uh, prayer after the imam's takbir, then the follower follows and engages in takbir. I guess, and before when they have to like, like before he starts reading Fatiha or um, He shouldn't engage in anything that's not connected to the prayer um, other than takbir after the imam's takbir. Yeah. And then uh, that's, that's the safest position.
So basically, you're in line, ready to join, uh, or ready to pray. The imam says takbir, and you say takbir after. Right? And then there'll be some positions that are a little bit easier uh, that might um, give it a little bit more time. And Allah knows rest. La ilaha illallah. No, um, so takbir uh, with the imam is important. Congregation is extremely important. Um, the imam continues. He says, the imam should say the opening supplication and the ta'awwud silently, like when praying alone, right? We talked about various opening supplications. Allahu Akbar kabira, alhamdulillahi kabira, wa subhanallahi bukurtam wa asila. Hopefully we learned that, some of us. Subhanak Allahumma, that's another one. Wajjah tu wajhi, the dadi fatara samawati wal ard is another one and so on. One should, the imam says, Allahu Akbar, then recites an opening supplication. Then, a'udhu billahi min shaitan rajim, all of that's recited silently. Then in a loud prayer, the imam begins, uh, al-fatiha, right? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, or alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, depending on, on um, the understanding of the book and sunnah that he's following. La ilaha illallah. Um, he should recite the fatiha and the surah aloud in both rakahs of fajr, the first two rakahs of maghrib, the first two rakahs of isha, and um, the individual praying alone does the same, right? And we all know that. Um, in addition to that, if he makes up a daytime prayer by night, he should recite aloud the first two rakahs. And similarly, if, uh, the, if a person makes up a nighttime prayer by day, the first two rakahs uh, are recited silently. And again, that may be, may be an area of some um, scholastic difference. That's a school um, that we are trained in. The Imam should say Ameen aloud in the audible prayers, as should the followers. The followers should say his Ameen at the same time. The Imam says Ameen, not afterwards. Okay, so that's an area of juristic difference. Um, the Shafi'i school says that the Imam uh, should say Ameen aloud, and the followers should conform to him saying Ameen aloud. Um, among the four schools, uh, the Hanafis and the Malikis say it silently. Shafi say it aloud. I'm not familiar with the Hanbali position. Um, it's very common for uh, people to be crypto Shafi'is in uh, the United States, um, though a lot of times they're not actually following a legal school. They're just doing what um, certain parts of uh, the Arab world believes uh, they were following the Shafi school and thus did that. Um, and that's due to certain ideological currents and uh, historical trends, um, contemporary trends here in the United States. Um, actually, if you're really following uh, a, a strict um, ijtihad of judgment from the Book and the Sunnah, for instance, in, in the view of Imam Abu Hanifa, uh, you would say your Amin silently. And, that, and he has his ijtihad, right? He has his, um, his judgment based on the Book of the Sunnah, uh, as do the Malikis. And it is um, the Shafi'is typically who recite their Amin aloud. La ilaha illallah. Um, Amin, what does it mean? It's the Jibyara. Answer my supplication, O oh my Lord, right? You've just made immense, uh, magnificent supplications to Allah in the Fatiha. And one of its names is the prayer of dua, right? So Fatiha is a big prayer of dua. And at the end of it, you say, Amin, answer my prayer, O oh, oh Lord. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam taught us that if um, the prayer of the Imam, the Amin of the Imam and the Amin of the followers coincides, uh, that the angels coincide with them and that it is um, accepted. And may Allah grant us that. Do you have a question? No. Um, and um, La ilaha illallah, and that's allowed and allowed prayers uh, in the view of the Imam. Uh, and silent in the silent prayers. The Imam may pause for a moment of silence after the Fatiha to catch his breath. During this pause, um, um, during this pause in the audible prayers, the follower should recite the Fatiha silently to himself so as to enable himself to listen when the Imam is reciting. So that's, um, that's an ishtihad of, 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 of the school of the imam, right? Um, so you have uh, a, you have schools where uh, the fatiha is carried by the imam for the follower, and the follower does not, doesn't recite at all behind the imam. And then, in the view of the shafi'i, followers recite fatiha as well, 
that's due to um, hadith uh, that he interpreted as, as meaning this. There is no prayer for the one who does not recite the opening of the book, right? So that means both the follower and the imam recite the fatiha. Um, nothing else is recited behind the imam other than the fatiha. And ideally, the fatiha of the follower uh, follows all of the fatiha of the imam. The imam completes his or her fatiha. Um, Amin, then the follower recites the fatiha. Um, if the follower feels that they will not be able to finish their fatiha before the imam bows, then um, they may recite fatiha along with them, though it should still be following them, meaning that it's not coinciding with the recitation of the imam, but slightly behind the recitation of the imam. And then in anything other than the fatiha, they stand and listen. It is a mistake, you know, even if you like the surah a lot, to recite a surah along behind the imam other than al-fatiha, it causes distraction and it is actually makruh, right? It is offensive, excluding when the imam makes a mistake and one recites that verse of Quran um, and it reminds the imam. Um, and one should intend reciting Quran, not pretending, telling the imam, hey, you forgot this, right? It's not communication, it's recit recitation of Quran. No, but excluding that, the uh, follower does not recite other than al-fatiha, behind the imam in the schools that say the follower recites at all. And like in Hanafi school, what I've understood is even in silent prayers, the uh, fatiha of the imam carries the fatiha of the followers. Right? So the followers do not recite uh, behind um, the imam. You had a question? Yes? As Yes, if you're confident you'll catch a congregation later, unless it's extremely late, um, you should wait for the congregation. If, if it's not extremely late, you should wait for a congregation. Yeah, and I can review the threshold of strength of extreme. Um, certainly, if you fear missing it, uh, then you, you pray. But if uh, but if it's not extremely late, it's better to wait for a congregation. And uh, if you want to be really tough, you could pray on your own in the early time and repeat when you get a congregation. Um, but it, what the question as just a rote question: Is it better to pray early or pray in a congregation? Unless it's extremely late, it's better to wait for the congregation. Allah knows best, and that is um, that is a question the jurist answered uh, specifically in that manner. La ilaha illallah. No, and then he mentions the point that we were just mentioning. Um, the followers should not recite any surah other than the Fatiha and audible prayers, except if he or she cannot hear the voice of the Imam. Right. So, the, in, uh, in an audible prayer, in a loud prayer, the follower just listens after the Fatiha. Um, say it's, it's a huge congregation, um, and this is talking about in a context where there is no amplification, right? So it's out of our context, um, where you don't hear anything, you're just standing, then the, recite, the, uh, the follower would recite. That's out of our context generally. You might find yourself in that uh, condition in Mecca maybe, but even with the loudspeakers from the minarets, that's unlikely, right? But in, in the past, a huge congregation, they may not be hearing. Um, and then in that case, they would recite. Otherwise, they don't recite. Um, la ilaha illallah. The imam should not say more than three tasbihs while bowing and while prostrating. And that was something we covered. That goes back to being brief, right? Not more than three tasbihah. Nor uh, should he add anything more in the first tashahad after the words, Oh my Lord, bless Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. Allah said, Ya Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad. Right? Um, so the point is, the, the imam does not elongate uh, when he is leading a congregation, with other than that, the very narrow conditions that were mentioned. Um, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. Um, the imam should read only the Fatiha and the last two rakahs. He should not lengthen the prayer for the followers. The imam should not lengthen his supplication in the last tashahud beyond uh, the combined length of the tashahud itself and sending blessings upon the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu and then also uh, the, the well-known supplication of seeking refuge from four things and so on. Um, when making the closing salutation, the imam should intend sending peace upon the congregation while the followers should intend by their salutation the returning of his greeting of peace. Right? So, um, the assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah 
He talked about intending directions in the last uh, lesson, um, greeting the believers on this side and the believers on that side, and um, including the angels. And we mentioned, though you do not intend uh, speaking, uh, you intend an interval of prayer in addition to your greeting, right? If you just intend greeting someone else in prayer other than the Prophet Muhammad so said, it invalidates your prayer, right? So intend following his sunnah, and from his sunnah is that these greetings extend to the imam that you're with, to the other congregants that you're with, to the angels on the left and the right, and you're following Prophet Muhammad so said, and doing this integral and extending the greeting to those people. Um, and, uh, and inshallah, you'll be fine. But don't just intend like you're praying with someone and I'm, or you're praying, excuse me, to Allah and then you greet the person on your side. Uh, one doesn't intend that. One doesn't intend to speak to anyone other than Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu when they are in Salah. As for Habib Sallallahu you can speak to him in Salah. Right? You're required to. You say, Assalamu alaikum wa ayyuhan nabiyu wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be upon you, O Prophet, and Allah's mercy and blessings. You can speak to Prophet Muhammad in prayer and it does not validate your prayer. Anyone else speaking to them in your prayer invalidates your prayer, right? So anything you do intended as an action of the prayer, and then um, there might be a meaning in his sunnah that extended to others, like agreeing to the believers on the sides, and then that uh, uh, that meaning also exists and um, is, is praiseworthy. He says, um, when making the closings, uh, um, immediately after the salutation, the Imam should turn around and face the followers. Um, he should refrain, however, from doing so if there are women behind him, allowing them thereby to the first. None of the congregants should rise till the Imam rises. The Imam can turn to leave from his right or his left as he wishes, but I consider the right to be preferable. That's a preference of Imam al-Ghazali. Um, the Imam should not specify himself in the supplication of Qunut in the Fajr prayer. Rather, he should um, say, O oh Allah, guide us, right? Rather than, O oh Allah, guide me. Yeah, but in the plural, O oh Allah, guide us. He should say it aloud and the congregation should say, Amin. They should not raise their hands as doing so is not established in narrations. Right? So he's saying, after um, finishing the prayer, the Imam turns around. However, how does the Imam turn? The Imam turns facing uh, what was his right at 90 degrees um, so that uh, he's facing his right and his right side is to the congregation, right? And he's saying to not turn around and look at ladies that are with one in a congregation until they have departed, right? Um, that's an etiquette. Uh, to uh, show more modesty um, to um, Muslim ladies that are not one's mahram, right? So he's indicating that etiquette uh, that doesn't apply when there is a barrier. Um, or for instance, uh, in our context, they may be remaining for a lesson, uh, in which case um, the Imam would deliver the lesson. La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. And he says, And um, again, kunut, what is kunut? Thana and dua. And um, the kunut is recited in congregations. Allah fi fi He's saying if you're an imam, you say uh, the plural, uh, first person. And if you're alone, you could say Allah mahdini. Right? And hopefully we're all praying in groups, so we won't pray it alone. Um, and then he also adds, and he says, um, and actually we're going to stop there. Um, we are going to stop there, uh, beginning with the etiquettes of the follower, right? Um, beginning with the etiquettes of the follower. Uh, so from the etiquettes of the follower is that the follower says, uh, Amin, when the Imam is supplicating in Qunut, right? Allahumma hadini, Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, Amin. During the supplication, the follower says, Amin. And then Qunut is also going to intent, include a portion which is not supplication, which is praise. Uh, and uh, the follower there may participate in the praise of Allah that the Imam is making. And after having said Amin to the Dua of the Imam. 
right? So the point being, um, there are specific prescriptions in the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu for the Imam and for the follower. All of these are taken from this example. When a person does these, uh, their prayer is um, multiplied by 25 degrees, right? It's of, of much more merit um, and much more likely to be accepted. And um, the great spiritual work between them and Allah and the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, however, it requires knowledge, right? And one of the subtleties of following that we encourage all of our brothers and sisters um, to adopt and specifically to teach our children. It is one of the common mistakes in following an imam is that um, the follower always delays his or her actions behind the imam. So when the imam um, says the takbir, the follower doesn't say the takbir until after the imam has completed it. When the imam is reciting fatiha in the case uh, in, the, in the schools where the follower will recite, they do not recite the fatiha until after the imam. They don't coincide with him. Um, the imam bows, and this is the point I'm making. The follower does not bow with the imam. Going along with the imam is makru. Going ahead of it, the imam deliberately is haram. The imam, the Prophet Sallallahu said, is meant to be followed. So anything that you coincide with the imam, it is makru. And when you do something makru in jama'ah, it ruins the reward for that portion of the jama'ah, of the congregation, right? So that's a subtlety of etiquette of the congregation. And why did I emphasize this with the kids? Because kids will beat you. They'll always be ahead of you, right? Um, so you bow and they're always down before you. You're going to prostration, they're always on the ground before you. Um, that is makru and they're coinciding with you and muharram if they get ahead of you deliberately, right? So if we're teaching kids to pray, we teach them that. Uh, and even sometimes you pray with adults, and as an imam, you're trying to race ahead of them to keep them from doing something makru, right? Um, so when the, your imam says takbir, don't say it till after. That's the point of validity. Fatiha, say it after them. The bowing, when the imam says Allahu Akbar, after they get settled in their takbir, you follow. The imam says Sami Allahu Liman Hamidah. After they come up, you begin, after they're completely up, you begin coming up. After their forehead touches the ground, you head towards prostration. Regardless of when they start the takbir, that's a subtlety and an etiquette, um, an excellence in following, right? Less than that, but still acceptable, is you begin your motion after they begin theirs, right? So they're on their way down and you start. Unacceptable as you're with them, it's makru. Ahead of them is even less acceptable, it's muharram, right? And the imam is to be followed, and there's a principle there, right? Uh, that the believer is a person who follows imams, right? That imam might be the local governor in the case of a Muslim governed place. It might be their shiur. Uh, it might be the imam that leads them in their home or in their local masjid. Uh, it might be someone who's leading them on a khuruj in the way of Allah. Uh, the believer should habituate on being a person of obedience as a companion of saman wa ta, a person of followership, right? And the prayer is an immense manifestation of that. Um, and when done so, it's a great, great work. So may Allah um, bless all of us to, again, establish congregation and establish it well with conditions. If you do your prayer in congregation, especially with people with a lot of presence, their presence will flow to you and your prayer will improve, right? Um, so one should seek out that type of company and keep that company, right? We talked in the last lesson about um, presence. One of the best um, means to acquire presence oneself is praying regularly in congregation with those who have presence, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu in many, many traditions, he indicated that a person would have the states of their uh, those with whom they are close, right? A person will have the religion of their close friend, be careful who's your friend. Um, a person will be with the one they love. The similitude of a good friend and a bad friend is like a musk merchant and a blacksmith. The musk merchant will give you some, you'll purchase some or you'll smell a fragrance. The blacksmith will burn your clothes or you'll have a stench, right? So if you keep the company of someone who with respect to Salah, they're like a perfumer. They're someone with immense presence with Allah, someone with the recitation and understanding from Allah in their recitation. You keep their company, uh, the fragrance of that will permeate gradually your Salah. 
However, um, that is when you've applied the proper etiquette of the salah um, so that the reward, uh, the validity first exists and then the reward continues of your prayer being connected to their prayer, right? Um, and uh, it's as if like you've hitched your wagon to their star, as they say in, uh, in, in, in the parable here, right? The similitude here. It's like that in salah as well, right? And much of the salah of a good imam will carry the followers, right? However, in order to attain that, we have to learn how to be good followers, and that is nothing other than learning the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and how to be a follower, right? And that's, um, you know, these are reminders, uh, and, and really one should take one text in one of the sound uh, Sunni schools um, and learn how to apply that in your individual prayer and in your prayer as a follower, and then you'll be doing it correctly according to the Sunnah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and you'll find immense benefit. Right, you'll find immense benefit um, if you uh, uh, apply these teachings because they are from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And um, and they're like medicine, right? And he's a skilled physician, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He's a skilled doctor. However, if we um, don't ask him, then we're not going to get the medicine from him. And if we listen, however, then we don't take his diagnosis, his prescription, then uh, we have only ourselves to blame, right? So if we learn Sunnahs of Prophet Muhammad like that, like these. Uh, that's like someone who receives a, script, a prescription from uh, their doctor. But if we just take them home and put them in the refrigerator and, and never uh, take the medicine and then go back and say we're still sick, that's because we haven't taken the medicine. But if we take these prescriptions from Prophet Muhammad so said, how to be an imam, how to be a follower, and we apply them, you'll find imams good, right? And you'll find uh, that you're coming closer to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and uh, you're learning in Salah. Uh, it's helping you um, uh, repent from sins. It's helping you leave bad habits and so on. Uh, and that's uh, what Salah will do if properly done. And may Allah grant us that by His mercy. And He's the most merciful of the merciful. So um, this is a question from Abdul Ansari. He said, if the Imam elongates the Allahu Akbar, does movement, from the does movement of the congregation before he finishes invalidate the prayer? Um, movement takbirs, uh, Movement during them doesn't connect to validity unless you get two movements ahead of them, right? Uh, so the answer to your question, uh, answering in the school in which I can answer, is that as long as you don't get two full movements ahead of the imam, the prayer is not invalid. Though one movement deliberately is prohibited, it won't invalidate the prayer, right? Coinciding with the imam uh, will invalidate the prayer of the war, right? However, it doesn't invalidate the salah. Getting ahead to uh, movements without an excuse, that will invalidate the prayer, as will getting behind to movements without an excuse. But there are many excuses to fall behind, like slow motion on your behalf or slow recitation. Um, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. So, are there any questions here before uh, we close? Yes, sir. Um, you may find there's some details there, but uh, in Maghrib and Fajr, um, some have the view that the vikirs uh, that are mentioned to be done before motion are mentioned prior to turning. Um, and that applies to the imam, um, though again that might be a subtlety that is applied differently uh, by others. Yeah, so the question is, there are some dhikrs that are supposed to be done without any motion, uh, like la ilaha illallah wa la wa la wa ala qadir, ten times at Maghrib and Fajr. Does the Imam say that prior to moving, uh, prior to turning towards the congregation, or really to his right side? Um, the answer is, in the view of some of the ulama, yes. Others might just say he turns, but he doesn't stand up, and that's enough of not having moved, um, and Allah knows best. Yes, sir. The hadith that you mentioned about the 40 days of prayer congregation, 40 days catching the opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam, yeah. Is that um, in masjid or any congregation of the Imam? Uh, ideally in the masjid, but any congregation, but it would, uh, but you have caught an opening Allahu Akbar with the Imam if you pray in, in, in any congregation, whether in or out of the masjid. So he said 40 days, the opening Allahu Akbar with an Imam, is that in the masjid or out of the masjid? Ideally in the masjid, but a congregation can occur in or out of the masjid. Though the collective obligation, the Farm Kifaya is only established by public uh, congregations.
but um, someone who prays at home, they have prayed in congregation, right? Uh, and Allah is best. And the masjid is an additional reward, and walking in the staff and a larger congregation, all of those are additional rewards. Yes, ma'am. Uh, if you don't turn your chest away from the Qibla, it does not invalidate your prayer. Uh, turning your chest away from the Qibla without an excuse uh, will invalidate the prayer. However, um, checking on someone in danger is an excuse to break your prayer entirely. Right? Um, even you're obliged. Like they say, if someone's going to fall down a well, you're obliged to exit prayer and warn them, like a blind person. Um, but uh, but you might have exited. But if your chest stays facing the Qibla, uh, you, you don't invalidate your prayer. Yes, sir. Sure. I don't understand the viewpoint here. Did if someone comes in late in a car and maybe you're on your shoe, is it permissible? If they say, what number are you on? To give them a hand gesture at any point, if they're asking you what number are you on, so they will know where they are. Uh, there was a question, uh, can someone ask what rakah are they on when joining? And someone motion with their hands. Motion with the hands, if it's not excessive, will not invalidate the prayer. Uh, but I'm not familiar with that as an etiquette of the salah, right? Um, and what I've been taught, they join, they pray what they catch with the imam, and they build on it um, and, and pray the remainder after. And they'll know how much they've prayed, uh, even if they didn't know how much he had prayed when they entered. Um, but if, if that's an etiquette that's uh, understood by some of the learned, um, I'm, un, 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 unaware of that. It's possible, um, but I'm unaware of that. And Allah knows best. Uh, yes, sir. Just to clarify what he's wearing here, in Hunud we should not raise our hands. Definitely. He's saying that um, that he's a mushtahid in the Shafi'i school, though some of his ishtihadat, uh, later jurists in the school preferred other than them. And that this is not this is one of those. So uh, the point he made about not raising the hands in Hunud, um, that is actually not the position uh, that the school settled in later. That's an ishtihad uh, of, of the of the imam of the imam of the the hands are raised and put them in the view of the school. So we'll pause there. Forgive us for going late. Uh, a, a number of brothers and sisters did a whole lot of work um, getting the building, uh, Dar Rahma, uh, closer to being ready. And we'll have a, an opening ceremony next week, inshallah. Everyone is invited. Um, after Maghrib on Saturday, the 4th of August, we will have a big majlis with some visiting scholars and guests and singers and poets on the 4th of um, Saturday, the 4th of, uh, of, of August after Maghrib. We'll have a big, big gathering here, which will be something of an opening ceremony. Uh, hopefully we'll complete, uh, have a relative completion of much of the work in the, the second building and on the exterior, inshallah ta'ala. So brothers and sisters, we've been working on that. That delayed us a little bit, uh, but we got a lot done. May reward, Allah reward everyone who worked accept from them and make it in their scrolls of deeds on uh, on, on Yom al Qiyamah and uh, make it a light for them in this world and the next and an expiation and may Allah reward you all on our behalf and on behalf of all of the Shiru and um, may Allah reward you for all of the knowledge uh, which is transmitted here in um, uh, for all times after in Khairul Musanafia and forgive any shortcomings on our part or injuries that happened um, or deficiencies of character or assistance or nutrition or um, hydration off one everybody drink because it was hot and uh, you can injure yourself if you don't drink well when you're in the heat so do take care of yourself and may Allah accept and um, next week we will um, not be having this lesson because um, there is another gathering uh, associated uh, with the events of the celebration uh, there will be a gathering also on Sunday the next day um, that will probably disrupt our Sunday um, our Sunday lesson at this time. The Sirah and Salawat, at least in a brief form, hopefully will still continue. And please recite Fatiha, seeking from Allah, sincere accepted works, beneficial knowledge, good teaching, calling to guidance. And that Allah be pleased with us and please the heart of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that the reward of the Fatiha that we recite go to our parents, our teachers, sheikhs, anyone we all right. 
and the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.